we'll solve this uh, pretty quickly. Well, we went on for about four or five minutes, and then uh, my uh, GNC, uh, the CSM, said, Blake, you know, uh, the Kirby report is a pretty large bang associated with this thing. And he says, I think I've got a lot of my projectiles uh, that have uh, closed on me. Uh, so then I, this happened to me before on Apollo 9. So this was now moved. We're going to solve this problem easy to tread lightly unless you stuck on a bunch of rope. No problems there. Well, then the real news, bad news came when Lowell's looking outside the hatch and say, hey, Houston, I see some kind of a gaseous substance. I, I believe we're venting our eyes. So it's interesting, you download, just like you do in flying airplanes, okay? You got the problem under control. Hey, quite cool, survive. That was the way you went through this thing. You went through it in a relatively uh, rapid period of time. Uh, the immediate problem was to, uh, what are we going to do? Uh, first thing I did is make the decision. Remembering this problem I had on a, a Gemini 9 for management reverse for my decisions about this EPA. I said, the first thing I'm going to do is force the issue. We're going to go around the moon. We're not going to execute a direct report. And this came as a shock to many people in this room because uh, we had no data. I had no data. I had a gut feeling. You can't believe the intensity of that gut feeling. Didn't know what happened. Didn't know what the problem was. But the one thing I wanted to do is to buy time. And basically, I needed time to pick the right path. Uh, so basically, I advised the entire team that uh, no more directed work. We're going to go around them. And the second thing was, was we're going to go and move into the lunar module. And whatever happens from now on, don't do anything. Don't do any screwing around with the one electrical bus that was still working. OK, don't do any configuration changes. Sorry. So we basically fight this thing for an hour and then hand over to Lenny's team, and he is immediately challenged, because the third fuel cell is not failing. We had brought two off previously, shut the reactor valves, uh, see if we can stop the leaks, that didn't work. So now the third uh, fuel cell is failing, and basically the lifetime is less than 15 minutes, so he scrambles the crew over the motor model to get the spacecraft powered up, but most importantly, he has to transfer the navigation data from the lunar module, which is going to die, and put it over the command module. And this is a very long series of transfers within these two controllers here to make sure that you're going to orient the platform in the command module to the proper orientation from the lunar module, the lunar module from the orientation from the command module. And that's all pencil and paper. We have no math. It's a tough job. Okay, well, what he's doing that, I'm walking downstairs where the fire team is forming up. And uh, we had some good news here and some bad news. First thing was we had a point of departure. Going back to the training in the sim suits. Uh, during Apollo 9, this is the first time a crew was in a spacecraft that couldn't re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And training loved to put us in a position where that lunar module was dead to water, and we had to execute a rescue with the command module. Well, this was a one to two day problem depending upon the geometry and the amount of propellant that would be used in the command module. So as a result of that, we developed a set of lifeboat procedures that we could use if we were ever dead in the water with the motor box. Well, this is the immediate point where we fell back to starting exercising these lifeboat procedures. Next thing after that is to set up a team. And I broke the team into three parts. Uh, you see, John Aaron very well depicted the movie. He's going to manage all the resources associated with this mission. Anything that basically is a consumable, he's managing. A guy named Arnie Aldrich, one of the branch chiefs, gets the job to handle all the procedures and basically integrate these no matter where they're coming from, put them together in the total package. We had a guy by the name of Bill Peters, an incredible controller, but he had, couldn't communicate with a crap. Okay? I mean, he just fumbled and stumbled right on down the line. But basically, I put him in charge of the survival-related stuff because his brain was good. If you had worked with him to pull that, what he did. So these were the three guys that were now working the problem. John Aaron took the job, and this is about two hours after the explosion now, and basically identifies three things we got to do. First of all, I got to cut the day off the return journey, and I take my team. The reason my team ended up doing is that we operated with four flight control teams for the lunar missions. Uh, this was to spread the training workload, also the shifts are very long and irregular, but we also designated one team as a crisis management team before liftoff. That happened to be my role for a third team. So get the team out and we're going to work the problem. So basically, John Aaron was the guy that picked up the electrical problem. He said, we got to cut a day off the return journey, because at that time, we were looking at between three and a half and four and a half days to get around the moon and come back home. So we had to cut the time down to closer to three days. And basically, I picked up that part of the job. And the way I'd approach that was as we went around the moon, the moon's gravity was going to pull us an arc and orient our velocity vector back towards Earth. And in the proper place in that arc, 
I'm going to ignite the lunar module engine to accelerate our forward velocity by roughly about 1,000 feet per second. Cut our diameter and turn turn. Uh, John then wants to uh, uh, power down the guidance navigation control systems. And I tell John, no, that's not the cards. And he says, why? This is the HMR used for most space time. And I say, John, we normally navigate with stars, but with this debris cloud that is surrounding the spacecraft, the clouds moving along at the same velocity as the spacecraft, we can't see stars anymore. All we can clearly identify is sun, earth, and moon. So Phil Schaffer, one of my final skits that John to come up with new ways to navigate, and he decides he's going to use the sun as a reference, and this has to be good enough to perform maneuvers with. Uh, so now we, uh, we move into the next phase of the mission, which uh, basically you go through a series of press conferences. See that little room? I didn't talk about that one in the corner. Uh, basically, the press moves in there, and this is where all the reporting comes from the mission. So we're living in visual. Everything that we're saying and everything we're doing, everything that's happening in this room is being reported live by these three people there. We now uh, establish the... Uh, Lucky has the team execute a, uh, a maneuver to get it back on what we call a free return. It's going to be too late for the crew, but mission control, we have a ground rule like the military that will no man left behind. So this at least brings the crew back to Earth so we had added some finality into the mission. We then uh, get to the point where uh, uh, we're approaching, uh, approaching the moon. We voice the instructions for the get home fast maneuver on board the spacecraft. And uh, the crew gets this, we then execute that maneuver, and during the start of the maneuver, the engine's fish tunneling, it's steering properly, it's all over the place, the engine just skimbling back and forth. And uh, this was one of two mistakes we made during the course of the mission. Uh, it was, we may assume that we'd have two, men, two crewmen in the lunar module when that occurred, and one crewman in the command module. Well, that made all three crowded in so they'd see what was going on, so from now on, no more assumptions, there's no more assumptions. We executed that maneuver. We're now coming home uh, uh, roughly a day and a quarter earlier. And then the only management the flap of the mission begins. Deke's waking up there and wants us to wants me to get the crew to sleep because he feels the crew's too tired. My boss Chris Kraft comes down, and leans on me, and says, No, you're using too much power. But then Chief of Engineering Max Vijay comes down and says, Don't uh, what you gotta do is you gotta restore thermal balance to the spacecraft. Well, that was a track we were already on. We'd been tracking temperatures for the previous 24 hours, and the sun side it was plus 150, dark side it was minus 180, so we had a 330 degree temperature change from one wall of the spacecraft to the opposite wall. Now what we have to do is invent a barbecue type maneuver to spin the spacecraft on its axis so the sun can eat all sides. Well, we got that done at about the time. Uh, we did that. Then the engineering comes up with a solution, another solution we need, which is the one you see in the movie where the crew is about 10 hours from suffocation due to carbon dioxide poisoning. And they uh, come up with a device to fit the spark scrubbers that we had plenty of in the command module to fit in the round hole in the lunar module. And that's just in time engineering. We build not one but two of these guys, and that cleans the atmosphere. And uh, then we get a few hours rest, and by the time we come in for rest, the uh, water system's freezing up. So we got to transfer water bags so I have something to drink. Navy tells me the typhoon's building in the land today, but Jerry Bosse comes up from the trajectory console and says, Light, we're going to miss the Earth. we got to perform an emergency maneuver. So we have to invent a maneuver. And we have no reference except for the uh, Earth. So we tell the crew to use the Earth reference. And on the, each one of the windows, we have a COAS, which is basically a telescope we use for rendezvous, docking, and navigation. We tell them to align the y-axis on the Earth's terminator, which is aligned between daylight and darkness, and that orientation will be uh, uh, engine will be properly positioned, correct the trajectory. Uh, so we move into that. We tell Lovell to uh, handle the vertical axis when the engine starts, keep the engine, keep the Earth from moving up and down, the haze keep the Earth from moving from left to right, you have to swipe 14 seconds in there. Uh, that works like a champ. Then we uh, got 24 hours to invent the checklist that we're going to use for re-entry. It's about 500 entries long. Uh, we've been working on that all along at about 90 minus 24. Walk over the simulators to find out how it's going. And Manning Lee's working the problem. So he thinks the procedures are done. But basically, we take a fresh crew that's never worked and have, have them run through this set of procedures. Uh, so then we start voicing up instructions to the crew at 90 minus 18. We work with uh, Swagger. Uh, it's easy with him. Fred Hayes by now is getting pretty sick. We didn't know that until after the mission. But uh, we finally uh, finished uh, voicing up the instructions to Fredo. And then we got about uh, four or five hours rest before we come in for the final shift. Uh, final shift doesn't start off too 
so well because uh, trajectory controllers tell me again that uh, we're going to miss the Earth and we got to power up the Lenin Guides computer for a maneuver to get back on the reentry uh, path, which then busts our electrical power profile. We get that done, but just about the time we're ready to go into entry or a battery failure.